In this video, we're breaking down the 10 most important concepts every structural engineer should master. In our first slot, we have tributary area. This is one of the most fundamental rules for estimating loads, and it's shockingly easy to overlook. At least in my own experiences and those that I've learned from other engineers, it's great to get a sanity check on someone's load takeoff. The engineer may have calculated that they got 100 kips on the column that they're designing, but with tributary area, I can take a fraction of the time to do a quick snapshot of load takeoff and compare it to theirs. They should be within an order of magnitude to one another, and if they're way off, you know then and there that there may be a problem. This is the kind of skill that senior engineers expect us all to know cold, and mastering tributary area helps you calculate loads quickly, double check software, and work efficiently, especially in the concept design phase, or if you're spot checking other engineers work. Coming in at number nine, we have the concept of slenderness ratio for columns, KL over R. Understanding column stability is essential for safe axial design, pretty much the main thing that drives the design of columns. The slenderness ratio KL over R shows how column length and conditions and cross-sectional shape combine to influence buckling behavior. Each of those individually are a topic all their own, but all of them together drive the concept of column design. It's a small formula with huge consequences. In number eight, we have load paths. Every structural decision that you make either completes or disrupts a load path. The best structural engineers resolve complex architectural designs with simple, effective structural solutions because they see the load paths clearly. And remember, loads are lazy. They want the easiest route to the foundation. So as you dive into this subject, just remember one thing, just because you can detail something complicated doesn't mean it's the best solution. Seeing how loads flow through a structure from roof down to the foundation, both vertically and laterally, helps you catch problems others miss. This skill gives you a pseudo x-ray vision, if you will, into a building's structure. A story is being told with the forces and how they flow through your design. You need to be able to understand that story and interpret what the next chapter may hold. Great engineers start with the simplest solutions to resolve their load paths and only add complexity if the situation truly calls for it. Number seven, composite action. Let's start thinking with multiple materials. Efficient designs often come from getting multiple materials to work well together. We have our four top building materials, wood, masonry, concrete, and steel, and they all have their pluses and they all have their negatives. But what if there was a way to combine the positives of all of our materials and leave some of the negatives to the side? This is what composite action is. Using the compressive strength of concrete while relying on the tensile capacity of steel, or using the lightweight properties of wood and achieving longer spans by re reinforcing in specific locations with structural steel. At its core, understanding shear transfer and interaction will help you optimize your designs. It's a high leverage concept that makes you good at both new construction as well as retrofit of existing structures. It's easy enough to replace a failing system with a brand new structure, but great engineers know how to modify and strengthen existing systems to meet the needs of the client, oftentimes saving money and making difficult asks possible. I suggest seeking out composite design examples of all types. They will deepen your understanding of structural design more quickly, and you will eventually be asked to do this by someone. Number six, we have good old fashioned shear and moment diagrams. You can't escape them. These diagrams are a window into how structures feel their internal forces. If you can sketch them by hand, you can sanity check your analysis and catch mistakes early in design. It's one of the best ways to build intuition and to become less dependent on black box systems. They can be enticing, I know, but doing it by hand every once in a while is a great skill to maintain. And for you non-engineers out there, you need to realize a well-designed structure appears to be doing nothing at all to the human eye, but within each beam, column, girder, anything else structural, there's an ever-changing flow of forces and stresses that moment and shear diagrams bring to life. Now, you should be going through hundreds of these examples in engineering school. Pay attention and keep this ability sharp. While it may seem like a beginner skill, it's incredibly powerful. Number five, we have lateral force resisting systems, LFRS. Now, I caution you, this is a very, very large concept because you can dive into weeks worth of studying on just the load derivation side of things, so how you generate your seismic forces or your wind forces for lateral design, or you can dive in for weeks and weeks on end to the capacity side of things, or the systems that we design in order to resist those lateral loads. Shear walls, moment frames, brace frames, something else. This topic can span 
many, many, many years of deep study. But understanding how shear walls or brace frames or moment frames behave make you indispensable on projects with real world complexities. Let's just talk about the system side of things. Start by understanding each system's strengths and weaknesses, how the lateral load type, AKA wind versus seismic, affects behaviors and where the common hotspots are. Things like cords, collectors, anchorage, and diaphragm connections to your vertical lateral elements. All things that need extra attention early in design to have a successful project. Great engineers don't compromise in this area. They know it's the most important aspect of a building's design, and we spend serious time studying it. Try to jump on numerous projects with different vertical lateral systems early in your career. Get a little taste of all of them. Even if you don't design the system from start to finish, if you get that exposure and you're in those meetings and you're talking with other design engineers, your collective knowledge will increase at a much more rapid pace, and it will become easier to fill in those blanks when it comes time to study them outright. Number four, serviceability limits like deflection, drift, and vibration. When we first start off, we're checking all of our designs for strength making sure they are strong enough to handle the forces that we're designing for. But serviceability, ah, that's a whole nother animal that we don't typically get exposure to early in our careers. And funny enough, serviceability is oftentimes one of the leading causes for engineers to come back onto site to fix problems that were missed. Focus some of your study time on things like deflection calculations, drift calculations, as well as the topic of vibration, because all three of these subjects really relate more to how people experience our buildings. Our clients and the public want to feel safe in our buildings, and it's these three topics that control that feeling of safety within the building. Your building can always be strong enough, but if it's moving all over the place and jumping up and down, it might not feel very safe to someone who isn't a structural engineer. So mastering these concepts in combination with strength design is critical for great engineers. In the top three, we have ASD versus LRFD philosophy. Knowing when and how to apply either ASD or LRFD isn't just about memorizing equations. It's about understanding the design mindset behind the codes. This area of study helps you better interpret code provisions, evaluate software output, and defend your design with authorities. Take the time to learn the differences between the load combinations, the background behind how these load combinations came to be and what they stand for, that's a big one. Which materials typically use which method and when each is appropriate, especially when balancing strength versus deflection checks. Uh, deflection sneakily kind of made it into third a little bit there. Well, let's keep going. In the number two spot, close to number one, but sadly number two, connection design. Connections are where buildings fail most often and where your detailing abilities are tested. If you understand how to design safe, practical, and code compliant connections, you'll be ahead of most engineers your age. Because I mean, think about it. Many of the core concepts that we've already talked about, stress, load path, local failure modes, use of multiple materials, and load types all come into play in connection design. In fact, connection design examples, in my opinion, are some of the best to hone multiple skills in one sitting, making them a powerful training ground for growing engineers. And funny enough, I think once you get good at connection design calculations, then when you're asked to design a beam or some type of member in a structure, it seems trivial, it seems simple. So stay committed, work on that connection design skill. And of course, what we've all been wondering this whole time, what is number one? That is engineering judgment and simplification. Let me know in the comments if it's a cop out, but hear me out, hear me out, hold up, hear me out. No matter how strong your technical skills are, your ability to simplify complex problems is what will make you reliable and fast. Engineering is full of gray areas. We like to think that we're in this black and white trade, but oh lordy, are we anywhere but. Judgment fills the gaps that codes and software can't. Developing this early helps you make sound decisions under pressure and communicate confidently with teammates as well as clients. And I know it's unfortunate that there's no specific design topic that can help you hone this skill. The only way is to get good and absorb good habits from seasoned engineers around you. And with time, I promise you, your engineering judgment will grow. And as I sit here now looking back in my career, I often found that the only way that I learned some of this engineering judgment is from projects that were missing that exact thing. And I experienced problems and I experienced hardships and I experienced difficult conversations that then we got through and I learned from them. But hey, that'll do it here today. Let me know in the comments down below what you thought of this top 10 list. Was there something missing? Was it out of order? Let me know. But as always, this is Rich with Team Kestova. Thanks for liking. Thanks for subscribing. Peace.